Welcome to Voices from the Bench, a dental laboratory podcast. Send us an email at info at voicesfromthebench.com or look for us on Facebook at Voices from the Bench. Greetings and welcome to episode 221 of Voices from the Bench. My name is Elvis. My name is Barbara, which everybody knows. We got to change that up. Are you wanting to change the intro or do you want to change your name? (laughs) Well, I just think everybody knows us, so. You know me, I'm always hoping for that new listener to join us on episode 221 and say, who the hell are these people? That's true. All right, so we'll just keep doing it. (laughs) Plus, I don't know if I could start an episode any other way. No, probably not. Yeah, I don't know what else to do. What's going on, Barb? How are you? Busy. Busy. I'm f***ing busy, and yes, and I'm just ready for a cocktail. Friday afternoon. <laughs> My head is at vodka and cranberry, Tito's and cranberry to be specific. At the beach, I hope? Uh, wherever. <laughs> In the parking lot, I guess? <laughs> no. <laughs> In the foyer with one no. foot in, one foot out. <laughs> We've got a small group going to a bar after work, and I'm looking forward to hanging out with everybody and chilling. Nice. Yeah. Do you go out with lab people often? I miss those days. Yeah, I mean, we try. We get yeah. together at a local place up the street and just hang out and shoot the shit for an hour or so. It's nice. It's nice yeah. to end the week on the a good note. Yeah, our last day of the week was a Thursday, and we, we did that quite often. It was really a great way to just... Mm, I don't know, just bond. Yeah, just you're not doing work. You're not, you're not angry. You're not frustrated. It's just, <laughs> it's a whole different dynamic, I guess. You don't get to see in the lab. All right. How about you? This last weekend was actually the first time I haven't traveled in almost five weeks. Wow. We're in the height of lab show season. Yeah. And I think four out of the last five weekends I was gone. I think the only reason I got one of those weekends off is because of Memorial Day. You know, don't get me wrong. I love it. I love what I do, and I love going to trade shows, and I love talking to people in the industry. I just kind of wish they'd spread them out a little bit, you know? Give me a few extra weekends in between to get caught up on house stuff. No doubt. But the next one that I'm going to, which unfortunately you won't be able to make it, but the next one I'm going to is Ladies of the Mill. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. I rented a house on the, on the beach for that week a year ago, so I really would love to make it. But my family comes first, and so does the beach, unfortunately. And to be okay. fair, I don't think they had a date a year ago. Yeah. So you had this thing planned out. But yeah. for those of you that have never heard of Ladies of the Mill, well, obviously you must have never listened to this podcast because... <laughs> We talk about it a lot. I mean, about a year ago, we talked to Jill Swafford and Christina Heslip. I think I got that right. About this meeting. And then last year at the meeting, I recorded a ton of great conversations. And you were the only male, one of them. Uh, about one out of six, probably. It's changing this year, though, which is It great. is totally changing. Sure, this whole meeting's geared towards empowering and inspiring women in the dental lab profession which is just amazing within itself, but there's absolutely no reason why everybody just can't go and join in and also be inspired. I don't care what sex you are. It's really one of my favorite shows, and it's happening again, like I mentioned, but this time they moved it to Nashville, Tennessee, July 22nd to the 23rd. And as an added bonus, on Saturday from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m., I will be co-presenting a hands-on course. Preet and my good friends at Annex USA are teaming up to do a pink aesthetics implant retained PMMA on Preet part course. Wow. Say that four times. I barely said it one time. (laughs) I don't even think I got it right. So Sarah Williamson, who I talked to at last year's Ladies of the Mill, she's from... Meraki, I think it's Meraki Dental Studio out in Colorado. She will be the instructor showing everyone how to get those beautiful lifelike results using Annex Gum Pink Composite. And I will be there to show everybody how to select and use the best pre parts for your cases. I'm also there just for eye candy, too. Of course you are. Of course. Tay from Annex USA will be there to, you know, make sure I don't offend anyone. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) Tay will be there, of course, to showcase what Annex does. But all kidding aside, if you're looking to get into composite or just improve your skills, sign up for the course. 
Spots are limited. So head over to ladiesofthemill.com to register for the show and to see the link to sign up for the course. And of course, all these links, we'll put them on this episode's show notes. Oh, God. Whew. Whew. You want to talk about what's going on this week <laughs> and not next month? <laughs> but real quick, it is still June and still CDT and Dental Technician Appreciation Month. We got a few good ones last week, so make sure you stick around until the end of the episode. So this week, we talked to a fantastic team. Now, you've heard of Three Shape and Exocad, right, Barb? Oh, hell yeah. Yeah, you probably also heard of Dental Wings and that InLab system, right? Mm-hmm. Have you heard of Excalibur? Yes. Only because you were part of this conversation. <laughs> of course. <laughs> so Craig Holland, eh, he's been in a few labs in his career. It's actually in his blood. It is so bad that he now owns Three Point Dental Studios in Ohio, and his employees are his daughter and his son, C.J. Holland, who also joins us on this conversation. After meeting and working with a prosthodontist named Dr. Wendy Clark, the team formed. Now, Dr. Clark joins us to talk about her journey into becoming the Director of Pre-Doctoral Removable Prosthetics at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Whew. How's that for a title on a business card? Fantastic. Having to teach a lot of students digital dentistry workflow and the ability to do it remote during COVID was the obstacle Wendy wanted to overcome. And knowing that Craig is a sure, why not kind of guy, they worked together to develop a design software that was open and free for the school. And now everybody else. Excalibur was born. Craig and CJ talk about taking the Blender software and recoding it to fit the needs of a dental technician. And Dr. Clark talks about providing the feedback from a clinical stance to help improve the software. So join us as we chat with Craig and CJ Holland and Dr. Wendy Clark. Hi, this message is for the many dentists and dental staff that are listening to Voices from the Bench every week. The fastest growing product that we have at Grow3x are our Grow3x aligners. Grow3x aligners are only available from Grow3x aligner certified labs. Why? Because we believe in the synergies that are being created between you, the dental office, and your lab. And we want to further leverage these synergies. Our aligners are, for instance, used as a pretreatment to larger restorative aesthetic cases. They're used to widen gaps prior to placing implants. They're used to close the diastema, ease crowding, and simply enhance your patient's smiles. Even for your Essex retainer needs, your growth 3 Aligner Certified Lab can help. Look for a growth 3 Aligner Certified Lab near you, such as Castle Dental Lab in San Antonio, Texas, ask for Blaine, AMK Dental Lab in O'Neill, Nebraska, ask for Anne, Stax Dental Lab in McCool, Maryland, ask for Derek, AA Dental Design in Marietta, California, ask for Frankie, and many, many more. For a complete listing of Grow3x Aligner certified labs, go to www.grow3x.com. Thank you, Grow3x, and we appreciate your support of the podcast. Voices from the Bench. The Interview. We are excited to welcome to the podcast today another great dynamic. It's been a while since we've had this on, but we have two technicians, father and son, and a doctor they work with out of UNC, correct? That's correct. All right. So let's introduce Dr. Wendy Clark. How are you? So far, so good. Happy Friday, everyone. Yeah. Happy Friday, indeed. And then out of Friedman, Ohio, right? That's correct. Yep. This is my research is terrible. Fremont, <laughs> Ohio, we have Three Point Dental Lab, Craig and CJ Holland. How are you guys? I'm doing good. Yeah, doing really well. So Craig, I actually got to visit your lab maybe last fall, walked in, amazing stuff you're doing. It just blew me away what you are doing in this lab that's, what, only three or four employees? Yeah, it's, and it's all family. So it's uh, me... Uh, my son, my daughter, and two of my sisters. Wow. Wow. That's awesome. I love um, that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, keep the payroll down. Yeah. <laughs> no one gets paid in the family. 
That's right. <laughs> Child labor laws. CJ, would you like to add a comment? <laughs> uh, no, it's all good. When I visited the lab, Three Points Dental, you were doing some really cool stuff. And really what stood out to me was you were using your own design software. Correct. Yeah. We're going to get into this. But when I asked you about coming on the podcast, you mentioned that you work with Dr. Wendy Clark out of the UNC, and it would be a great dynamic. Oh, yeah. So I don't even know where to begin here. Let's go, Dr. Clark. Let's hear your story. How did you end up at UNC? I was actually in private practice with Team Atlanta for seven years, which is where I met Craig. (laughs) And, you know, I always wanted to teach. That was my favorite part of what I was doing in practice. And I just decided to bite the bullet and move to UNC. I've been here for almost five years, and I mostly teach removable prosthodontics, but I do cover the dental student clinics and all aspects of prosthodontics, so implant, crown and bridge, and restorative. Now, everybody says that current dentists in school don't learn removables. Oh, no. (laughs) I have a lot of work to do. (laughs) This is what we're hearing. I have a lot of work to do. (laughs) We teach a lot of removables. We actually teach both conventional and digital for complete and partial dentures. Wow. So how many dentures do the students have to make and seat? We want them to do about four arches of dentures and four arches of partials, but a lot of them do a lot more than that. A lot more? Because... I don't know, Barb, we hear a lot that students are coming out not even doing one. Yeah, that's correct. I would agree. (laughs) Maybe they're not going to UNC. I hope not. (laughs) They're all pulling the wool over my eyes. We're going to direct them there. (laughs) So kind of take us through the um, curriculum, if you don't mind. So how do you teach a student? Like, where do you begin? We begin at the beginning. (laughs) So we we talk about anatomy and edentulist anatomy and what the different landmarks are. We go through alginate impressions, custom trays. Uh, Border molding, vinyl impression, wax rims, wax tooth try-in, processing, everything start to finish. And we've kind of side-by-side integrated the digital with that. So they do a digital tooth arrangement, a digital custom tray. They learn about monolithic try-ins and Wagner try-ins, and then the difference between milling and printing and processing. So they're actually technical at that point, like technicians. They actually don't fabricate dentures as part of the curriculum. They do help the design process for the digital dentures, but... They, in clinic, they stop at wax tooth try-in. Okay. Um, and then the, we send to local laboratories to process. And is one of the most important things you teach is just trust your lab? <laughs> Always. <laughs> they know better than you do? Is that like... 101. <laughs> well, we do try to teach partnerships between lab and doctors. And Craig actually comes in. He's an, He holds an adjunct faculty appointment at UNC. And so he'll come and do some presentations with the students and he'll interact with them one-on-one. We have a, one lab tech in-house that will do the same for fixed. So we try to make sure they actually meet dental laboratory technicians <laughs> and figure out how to talk to them and what to say and the, the right way to say it. And they get points off if they don't write thank you on their lab slips. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> I like the little heart and smiley faces. Those always made my day. (laughs) Great. Great segue. So you actually go into UNC to teach? Uh, Sometimes. Sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes I go there to to help with the delivery of a case or uh, to deliver cases like a project case or something. Uh, So I'm heading down this weekend. I used to go once a month, but then... it got to be a little hard to uh, manage. Yeah. So no, it's... Now it's basically when when Wendy asked me to come down. Which is twice a month, right? (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) So, Craig, let's talk about how you got into the industry. If I remember correctly, not to sound dirty, but you've been around. Yeah, I'm I'm a bit of a lab slut. Um, I started out in the Navy as a dental tech. And then when I got out, I found out that dental technician in the Navy and on the outside meant two different things. So in the Navy, it was a dental assistant but they called them technicians. And on the outside, it was the lab, which is the part I really actually enjoyed. So, Mm -hmm. And from there, I I started working for different labs. I opened my first lab. I was way too young. And I think I was 21, 22. Yeah, I think you were 21. Wow, yeah. But I had that for a few years, got divorced, lost that one. And then I worked for other labs and then opened another lab and and had that for several years with two of my brothers. And then the economy went to crap in 2010 and so we lost that and then i went working again at more different laboratories like in detroit worked at olson and worked with mike gerard at, at modern yeah and that's when i met wendy 
was through that. And uh, then I went down to Atlanta and worked at GGS with her. Wow. And then ultimately, fast forward a few more labs, <laughs> ended up opening up Three Point. And it's been, this is where I needed to be. This is, it was a long journey to get here, but this is, I think, my final stop. So I'm not slutting around anymore. <laughs> okay, so the hundredth lab is where you stopped. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm getting close to that, yes. Yeah. So how did you convince your family members to join you on in that endeavor? How did they get into it with you? Mostly at gunpoint. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> no, it's, my kids kind of grew up in a lab because I, I owned my first lab. And it was in the basement like anybody else. And that's where you start in basement mm-hmm. or garage. Mm-hmm. And so the way they were little. My daughter was pouring models when she was six. You know, she... Originally, she was just pouring like PTC molds. Same here. With extra stone. Yeah. And then ultimately, she was getting fewer bubbles than I was. So I'm like, here, try this. And I gave her an impression. <laughs> yeah. So then, you know, she was doing really good. So I put her to work and it was free labor. But then by the time I had my second laboratory here in town and it was more substantial, my kids were in high school. And so after they're done with, with classes, they'd come over and, you know, at the time we had the, the Forte, Procera Forte. Yeah. So CJ was doing the scanning and, and designing the copings and crystal was crystal's my daughter she was uh working in the models and helping out in waxing and learning other things so they just they kind of grew up in it you know i'm sure cj would tell you that when he'd use the bathroom he'd see the dental magazines and so that's how you learn the terminology. <laughs> oh, that's, you know? great. that's where my dad read yeah. his <laughs> yeah so that's where everybody listens to the podcast too oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> No, for me, I listen to it when I'm on my drive to UNC. Oh. So, yeah. <laughs> nice. I've got 12 hours to go. I'm like, okay, voices from the bench. It's how far back this would go. The school doesn't <laughs> fly you out there on a private jet? Rude. We'll work on that. I've got a good car. It does really good on mileage. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it, it doesn't cost me anything for gas. So I'm, it makes more sense for me to drive. So your daughters, when they graduated from high school, did they go right into the laboratory and start working for you then? Uh, Yeah, they just got the one daughter. And yes, when she was in high school, uh, she worked with me. And then when she graduated, she went to college. She's an RN, so she's a nurse. Wow. And then uh, she got married. And she has one daughter and then has a bun in the oven. And her and her husband just moved back here to Fremont. They were in Detroit. And uh, when they moved in town, I needed her help. She knew that because she could see I was disorganized yeah and uh, so she came in and started helping and that she's just like I said she runs a place she really does she tells me and cj what to do and we can say <laughs> yeah okay yes <laughs> <laughs> you know you got we, it. We'll, we'll do the work we let her do the thinking and the organizing she's without her the, the business wouldn't be doing well yeah so. that's fantastic and her daughter's already working right yeah, yeah, I think you met Lily. Yeah, one, my one of my granddaughters. Yeah, yeah it's just, we've got a little playroom here, so she spends a day here with us, and she'll walk around with a notepad and a pen and make people sign it, and <laughs> check it, make sure it's right, and then walk to the next person. She thinks she's doing work. And she plays with the models and organizes them. So we have extra models for her to play with. Yeah, so it's kind of funny. She's already getting involved. And then I've got three other granddaughters, CJ's yeah, daughters. Yeah, I've got, I've got three girls, so they do less work. They're more chaotic. Um, but... <laughs> so you've got longevity, that's for sure. I was going to say, you're <laughs> never going to hire. Just wait. No. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Love it. When Wendy and Craig, you guys started working together, what brought on the collaboration? Why did you start working together? Well, as you probably are aware, that sometimes prosthodontists are a little bit needy. <laughs> And I, I somebody, Stay quiet, Barb. <laughs> I will. I found somebody that would listen to me. And so he was reading my lab slips. And then I had a couple of cases that were really kind of off the wall. And I wanted to try something new. And we had an in-house tech at the time that didn't want to <laughs> have anything to do with it. So I asked Craig and he's like, oh, that sounds crazy. I'll do it. <laughs> um, so, do you remember the case? Uh, which one was it? Was it the weird little zirconia yeah, the zirconia with the, uh, what did you put in there? I don't remember. Some kind of, one the hater clay? You made a bar. We made a little zirconia bar that we cemented. It was like a bar and sleeve case for some um, challenging implants. <laughs> you made a bar out of zirconia? Yeah, it's when I, this was when I was at Modern. Yeah. Uh, this is one that had that clip in it, right, Wendy? Yeah, and the patient didn't want any metal in her mouth. And so we had to, yeah, <laughs> she had one yeah. piece zirconia <laughs> implants. And we had to get really creative on how to restore these. Yeah. Wow. It, it, and she wanted it removable. She wanted it, it removable. Two units. 
<laughs> yeah, it was two units and she wanted it removable. And yeah, we, okay, at the time, in all honesty, I, I mean, I even told Wendy at the time, I said, you're crazy, but I'll do it. I, I did not <laughs> think it would work. And that's standard when it comes to Wendy's ideas. It, I was like, you're nuts. It's not going to work. She'll oh, just trust me. It'll work. I'm like, all right. And so I'll do it. And every time it works so far, knock on wood. But it's, it's standard for her to say, no, it's fine. Just that even with her veneer prep, she's very conservative with her prepping. And she'll say out front, you're going to tell me I didn't take enough off, but I did. And, I look, <laughs> and my first thought, I look at these things is she didn't take enough off. There's no way this is going to work. And I'll call her up and tell her this is not going to work. And she's like, just do it. I think it'll work. And it works. And so I, <laughs> she's just got one of those brains that she can see things that I don't. So yeah, that case was weird. It was kind of cool though. And it, and it worked. So like I said, she's right. So basically the relationship is crazy ideas and someone willing to do it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 Okay. Much. I mean, it's, a, it's something we all get excited about is that kind of situation. Well, yeah. that's even how the software thing came up. Yeah. She yep. wanted something for a school and she's contacted me. So, Hey, can you get Blender to do this, that, or the other? I'm like, I don't know anything about computer programming. And so she kind of dropped it. And then when COVID hit, she's like, um, now that you've got time, you know, so wow. like, okay, There's I guess I'll start sure. learning the code, right? You know, so <laughs> you're right, CJ, getting cases in that are crazy. That really is what makes a, an interesting day at the lab. Yeah. You know, we can I do agree. posteriors all day long, but once you get that challenging case, no matter eh, how much you really don't want to do it, eh, it makes the day interesting. Absolutely. It brings yeah. up the monotony. I agree. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I get all sorts of weird stuff, so <laughs> maybe Craig can share a case. <laughs> Why? Do people go to the school because nobody else will touch it? or <laughs> Sometimes, and I think kind of our practice was that way too, where a general dentist that have a case that they don't know what to do or how to start, they refer it to a prosthodontist. And I think oh, yeah. I, I kind of when in doubt, reputation. refer. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I kind of gained a reputation of not saying no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I got all sorts of weird stuff sent my way. But I think that's what prosthodontists do. I mean, you guys take on those very difficult cases that other docs just don't want to touch. And that's, you know, that's the gift. Yeah. Or the curse. Yeah. Or the curse. <laughs> it depends yeah. on the day. Yeah. <laughs> so what case needed to be done that made you design software? And what in the case was... Yeah, so this was actually for our class. So when COVID hit, we had to start teaching our, one of our classes remotely. And we, it was partial dentures. And so we had to remotely teach the students to survey and design. Oh, wow. wow. Yeah, that is tough. And I don't know how much you know about the price point of 3Shape, but it's not much less for dental schools. And so to try to get 80 students at home to have three shape was just not possible oh yeah 80 seats i think they called it that's yes. expensive yeah. yeah yeah so at the i mean there was no money because of covid and there was no time because of covid <laughs> so sure uh we asked craig if he would do it and like i had been sending him a lot of work and then when covid hit i stopped so i didn't see patients for a little while so i ended up teaching a lot more and he he had a little more time <laughs> so we sat down <laughs> um my colleague ingeborg de Kock and craig and i kind of sat down and hammered this out insanely quickly. So Craig, did you have time or did she just assume you had time? Oh, I had time because, I mean, when COVID hit, I, the world shut down. Yeah. And, and so I had cases, you know, I got caught up on all my work, of course, within that first week. And then since all my doctors weren't allowed to see patients, you know, it was kind of odd and it, it opened up very slowly. So one of my biggest accounts, of course, is going to be UNC. It's going to be the dental school. And sure. UNC closed up before anybody did. They weren't the last open, but they were working on that concept. Yeah. And then even locally here in Ohio, you know, Ohio shut down in general. They just told Dennis they weren't allowed to see anybody outside of emergencies. Well, yeah. I don't do removable work, so that kind of takes me out of that game. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I was pretty much shut down by proxy, which was really horrible timing for me because I had just opened the lab, too. So I... I think I was like three months old. So yeah, it was well, like, yeah, I've, uh, got, I've got bills paid and I just rented this space. I'm like, how am I going to pay rent? But I was sitting at home and I do remember Wendy saying, well, since you got time, do you think you can work on that software idea? <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> maybe. And, you know, and she had another friend she was talking to, uh, Maroos. He's a doctor out of Iowa. And, and so he was familiar with Blender, but not the programming side of it. 
but he, he was a help too. And Dr. DeCock, uh, Ingeborg, she was crazy good at, at helping me diagnose things and, and teach me about removables. Cause one of the modules they wanted for the school was for removables. And I'm like, I'm a fixed tech, man. I, yeah. Yeah, I hand that stuff off. I don't know what you're talking about, <laughs> but I definitely did have extra time and really to learn how to do this stuff. It's, it's just called YouTube. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hours and hours of YouTube. And the hardest part isn't programming. It's what well, scripting is yeah. to do with correct me, but that isn't the hardest part. The hardest part is figuring out what question to ask YouTube to get the answer mm-hmm. you're actually looking for. Interesting. You know, yeah. About so, context. So you learned yeah. all of that on YouTube? Yeah. Yeah. I was going to ask how you go from being a dental technician to creating software and you were self-taught. Yeah, just YouTube. Yeah, wow. <laughs> I mean, it's it's pretty sad, but I mean, it's that's the reality. There are some forums where we I don't think you ever had to ask a question, but it's really Google. Yeah, you it's Google like everything, answers. and it's like if I wanted to create an offset model, and you, if I Google, you know, Blender is a is a base program that's all based on, and if I Google how to make an offset model, you're going to get all kinds of weird results but not something that's actually going to offset but eventually you figure out that blender causes you know expanding a model or changing the size of it because you don't want to just hit resize that doesn't keep it in the right dimensions but sure. they actually have a modifier called displacement modifier so when you learn that you're like okay how to displace a model and it's like i said it's really the knowing what question to ask was the hardest part it was just that figuring makes out sense. what yeah. question do i need to ask to get the results i want the software that it's all based on blender that Basically, our software is just like an add-on for Blender to modify it to make it more useful for dental applications. By default, Blender is a open CAD program that you know animators use, game developers use, that kind of thing. So finding dental-specific answers is incredibly difficult. Um, you have to try to change your perspective when you're searching for those terms and look at, okay, if I was trying to just change a 3D object that wasn't a tooth, what would I look for? And that kind of thing. So Blender in itself is just a CAD software that's like open platform. Yes. yes. It's open source. And it's free. To Isn't sell. there already a dental version of it? Yeah, it's... there's two of them. The two that I'm wearing. There's probably more. Yeah. That's you. There is because then there's one out of Brazil too. Yeah. So Patrick Moore has one at D3 Splint. And it, it's amazing for Splint. So it's like, I can't compete. That, that guy is a mathematical genius. He's a dentist, I believe in South Carolina. And his, his is called D3 Splint, and it, it's modestly priced. And mm-hmm. then uh, there's B for Dental. That's the one I've heard of. Yeah, Michael Tanneker, and he's out of, I think, Australia. And his is really nice. And we kind of took ideas from both of those things and, and kind of built our own based off of things that we liked and things we didn't like. But that's the whole concept of Blender, what, what they call the spirit of Blender. The Blender organization itself, it is free, and anybody can download it, anybody can use it. And anybody can write programs, and it's called an open GPL. And the idea is I see a program or I get a program and I like it, but I want to make it better. I go in and I tweak it and I change it or I add modifiers or buttons or whatever I want to do. And then I distribute mine, whether it's I charge for it or not, it doesn't matter. But I, when I, the rule is I have to show my code too. So my code has to be available. So anybody can go in and see what I wrote. And they can uh, change it. So yeah. say wow. I get Patrick's and I change it and I make it better. Then he sees it. Oh, that's interesting. And he grabs mine and he changes it and makes it better. And that's how Blender has grown over the years. And like I said, they call it the spirit of Blender. Blender itself has grown in, in those regards and all those aspects of gaming mm-hmm. and yeah. animation. Other people are modifying and changing it. And Blender itself says, wow, I like that. And they add it to the next version. Wow. That's fascinating. Yeah. I would never even like think I would be so interested in this, but it's fascinating because I'm not a software person and my mind doesn't think that way, but that's pretty awesome. Did you use Blender before you designed the software? Were you using it already in production? Not in production. I was playing with it with Patrick Moore. I was, I was working with him and trying to come up with some things. Uh, he's a great guy. So I was using his, his software quite a bit, but not in production. And then, uh, be for dental. I bought that program and I was using, it just had two modules, two or three modules of his. I and mean, I was using it. It was really nice. And it was more user-friendly and I liked that. But again, it wasn't quite what I wanted and used very little in production, like for custom trays, things like that. Mm-hmm. And then when we developed this, we ran across B for artists, which is a knockoff. That's not really a knockoff. It's, it's, a, it's like a module. It's a, it's a modified version of the yeah. core Blender program. It's a little easier to use. It's very user-friendly and much more closely related to what 
dental techs are used to as far as like ExoCAD. It's very close to ExoCAD. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so we use that B for Artist, which is a version of Blender for our software. And like I said, I look at everything. The whole way I designed this one was from a dental technician's perspective. So in order to accomplish anything in production with our software digitally, you have to make a solid model because in my mind, the first thing I have to do is pour that impression and make a model. Mm -hmm. And then on the model, I'm going to trim it and I'm going to base it. And so everything, you have to do the same things in our software that you'd have to do in reality, which, Mm -hmm. you know, some people say, well, that's taking more time. Yes, it does. But you know what? To me, it works in my brain because I'm a dental tech. Mm-hmm. The other software is you get the scan and you can design right on the scan. And mine, it won't work unless it's a solid model. It has to be a solid scan. It has to be what they call a manifold. You can't have any non-manifold edges. So the first thing you do is you do models. And then if you want to do a crown, then you're going to do your die cut out. And then you're fine trimming you mm-hmm. know, to ditch the die. And then you're going to put in your die spacer. And it's called die spacer. You know, I, I followed all the steps as close as I could to what you actually physically do. So that way, any dental technician that's playing Mm -hmm. with it, they know what the next step is. Look for the button that says that, and it'll lead you in the right direction. That makes Uh, sense. Yeah, (laughs) it's a lot of sense. You're doing. How close did you work with Wendy when designing the software? I mean, Wendy, did you have a lot of input? Particularly for the removable one, since that was the one we were using first to teach our students. We really liked that workflow of not skipping the steps because it kind of like locked in some of the analog steps that the students were missing. So they poured the model, they put it on the surveyor, they found the path of insertion. What was really cool is they got to even see some steps that they didn't learn about, like blockout. They never really understood blockout because it's not something that you do as a dentist. And so that was really cool. And then after we got that one worked out, we worked on a digital waxing one for our anatomy course. And then from there, we started playing with some of the production stuff. So we would send each other scans of our own teeth. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and design different things for each other. So, yeah, I mean, he would ask me some of the clinical stuff, like, would it make sense to have this or that? And it was pretty cool. Could you have skipped steps digitally, but you left them in in order for teaching purposes? You can skip steps, sort of skip them. So I can put it in the background where you don't see it occurring. Yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah. Where it's like automatic. Yeah. But then that also takes the control away from you. And again, um, to me, a dental technician and a prosthodontist are typically think alike. We like to be able to finagle and, and tweak and modify and make crazy things. Uh, so we need some <laughs> control. So if I take out a step, I make it automatic, like say an offset that we were discussing earlier, and I want mm-hmm. the offset to always be 0.07 millimeters, I can make that automatic. And that way your die cutout is always the same. But now if your printer is a little bit different than mine and you need it a little bit tighter, you can't change that unless you know where to go in the code. So yep. at least there's our extra steps involved. But to me, it, those steps are necessary for anybody to be able to tweak it for their system or their needs. I think that's important with all software because a lot of the ones that we deal with in our industry, not tweakable as much as you would want it to be. Right. right. Yeah. And, and CJ used to train three shape for Ivoclar. He used to work for Ivoclar. Oh, he wow. Yeah. Training. Yeah. So th- there's a lot of times like three shape might be faster at things, might even be better at some things, but Blender is open where, I mean, you can do animations on it. So it doesn't know what you're doing. It doesn't care. It's up to you. So when three shape doesn't allow you to do something and ExoCAD doesn't allow you to do something, Blender doesn't care. You can do it. You just got to figure out how to do it. Yeah. Well, compare CJ, the yeah three shape in this new program. I don't think we've <laughs> said the name of it. You called it Excalibur, right? Yeah. The development of it, like even the names and stuff like that, it started off, we were trying to name things after swords because we thought it was cool. So <laughs> yeah, we started with, for the educational software that, you know, started everything it was called Gladius. And then we ended up through the course of development and everything that became our Merlin software. So nice. that's our educational and because we started on Gladius, we went to another sword for the production software, and that's Excalibur. So we have a separate kind of subsidiary company, I guess would be the term, for 3.x, which is just for software development in general. So that's where we host all these things. For me, as a user of the software, I went from, I'd say over the course of the past year, we went from doing pretty much everything in 3Shape to, mm-hmm. I mean, we just recently got an ExoCAD license, started using that. but. I would say that all of our models, 100% of our models are that are digital are produced in Excalibur now. 
Nice. Yeah, and for single unit like FCZs, crowns, crowns like 80%. yeah, something like that. If it's a single unit or just like two or three, I'll still do it in Excalibur. If it's a large anterior case or like long span sort of deal or multiple units in a row, I, I prefer to go into ExoCAD because our software is not quite user friendly for multiple units. But for single units, it's it's my go-to. Now, that being said, as somebody who understands the training perspective and everything, I, I have to agree that if you're just getting into digital, it can be easier to learn on something like ExoCAD or 3Shape just because it, it is built for dental applications. From yeah. it. it is very user-friendly for that purpose. But like for me overall, as a technician, looking at it, I prefer to have the control that I get through Excalibur. Like my dad was saying, the ability to kind of tweak things and go outside of what you would normally be your, your standard working parameters in 3Shape is invaluable. It's incredibly important to be able to do that. I always say it's like a, a Mac versus a PC where it's easy kind of. to crank open a Mac and like start working on it, but you can't unlock as much stuff as you can on a PC. It may not be as easy to learn. So if you're not familiar with software or you haven't worked with CAD very often, 3Shape is going to kind of walk you through cookie cutter, this step, this step, this step, this step. But like CJ said, if you go on to Blender, you can really do anything. And if you hear people that have worked with 3Shape a lot, they get frustrated because things get up, locked up and they can't do what they want to do. So yeah, it kind of, I think, depends on your skill level. So I think if you, you're an entry level user, you're going to have a lot more success with something like 3Shape or Exacad. But if you have been using those for a while and you've gotten frustrated that you're getting locked in and working with Excalibur opens a lot more doors. Hmm. Did you see that with students that were using the software? Yes, absolutely. And there's some students that they got really frustrated because they've never used any dental software before. And so, I mean, we had to kind of sit with them and coach them through it a little more. And then there were other students that had technology backgrounds and they just loved it because they could do so much with it. So we saw a really wide range of skill sets with the students based on their previous experience. That's cool. So the software Excalibur... It's out for people to download yeah. for free? Yes. Yeah, 100% for free. So if a lab wanted to give this a try, they go to a website, download it, and what? You're just up and running? Any scanner can plug into it? No, it's not directly integrated with any scan systems. Okay. You would need to get STL files from them. So, I mean, you mm -hmm. can theoretically use any scanner, but it's not going to be like a three shape or ExoCAD where it's okay, do your scanning and hit next. And then you're designing. It's going to be more do your scanning, find your files, bring them into the design software and then use them from there. So yes and no, like I said, it requires a little bit of a knowledge of the structure of things. It's not just, you know, plug and play, but that said, yeah, there's no additional, like the installer installs everything for you. And assuming that you don't have any of our beta versions, because when you can attest to that, sometimes that can be difficult to install the new from the beta versions, but moving forward, it should just be an easy, you run the executable, you're done installing it. And yeah, we're still working on that. Oh yeah. Currently for the production software, we don't have Mac OS available. It's just windows. Educational, um, software. educational software is available in both. Interesting. How are you guys marketing this? Uh, uh, we're on Voices from the Bench. <laughs> <laughs> We've got some posts on my sister runs our uh, Instagram page. So yeah, that, and yeah we, just, we, we have... occasionally post something or Wendy will post something. Honestly, I, I think a lot of our posts have been reposting Wendy's yeah, posts. <laughs> mostly, I'm too busy. So, so you're fielding phone calls from laboratories that are interested in using it or do they just go on and download it? I mean, do they connect with you guys? We haven't gotten uh, really any hits like that. Oh, you got the one from Spain? Yeah, I, I, had a, I had a student from Spain a couple of days ago ask for some information, you know, um, but we haven't really gotten big yet or anything like that. Um, and th this is something I also want to kind of say is a, part of the reason that we decided to go free with this is the fact that we're kind of limited as in terms of what we can do in terms of like s remote support or anything. I mean, it, we're limited on time. Yeah, we're limited yeah. on time. Oh, yeah, it, it, we're, we're operating the lab. He only has a few kids, so. <laughs> yeah. We're here late every night working on lab stuff. And then, you know, at eight o'clock at night, yeah. I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah, I don't have time for software. You yeah. know, and it's just, you get tired. So when yeah. we realize we're not going to be able to support it like we would need to, it's like, well, then I don't want them paying for it. You download it. You know, go to YouTube. That's how I learned it. But Ultimately, we want to get enough tutorials out there that you could that will walk people through sample 
cases or whatever, you know, sample things on each module because there's a lot of modules there now. Yeah. So we want to get the tutorials up. We just, we have to, again, time. We have to get the time to actually record them. And Currently, I have a tutorial up walking through just the installation process just to make sure everything goes smoothly for that. I have recorded videos for the uh, model workflow and the uh, die cutout workflow. Um, the next one I have to do is the crown crown and bridge module. So you can see how to make a single unit crown, that kind of thing. I also have recorded a couple of case study situations. So, you know, doing a full arch versus doing a quad and that kind of thing, but I haven't gotten them fully edited and produced yet. So, but hopefully very soon we'll have those up on the website. So they'll be available. That's cool. That is really neat. So basically anybody can get into it. And then you guys are working on the support on the back end. So you're super busy. And yeah, if somebody downloads it and they have a question, there's a, a what a, there's a contact. Tab. Yeah, contact there's, there's a contact us thing. There's a support tab, that kind of thing that'll get an email out to us. We'll respond as soon as we can, but it's not something that, you know, I, yeah, it's not going to be like calling three shapes. Yeah. Saying, hey, what's going on? Yeah. Can, oh, heck so you don't yeah. want to be technical support. Well, you might not find anybody there either. Sorry. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that wasn't very nice, Elvis. You probably shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have to explain that. Yeah, no. yeah, I'm full-time at the lab now. So, so Wendy, you're using this all at the school, right? Yeah, yeah. We're using the custom tray module from Excalibur in our denture class. We use the RPD module in our partial denture class, and we use the anatomy builder in our dental anatomy course. So I'm inside your brain. So are you already thinking about what else you'd like to add? Yes. Yeah. We <laughs> and this is a little bit probably outside of the scope of Blender, but anybody that's listening that wants to play, I would love an AI module where we can learn to do MMR and how to contour wax rim and all that stuff. And that might translate really well to monolithic try-ins from a club. Oh, big time. So you're just waiting for the next wave of COVID to shut down the U.S. and they can get back to work. <laughs> yeah. Craig the time. Off the record. Yeah, no, I'm just joking. <laughs> It's the YouTube and AI stuff. Yeah. So are you currently working on additional things for the software? Yeah, occasionally. The the, yeah. <laughs> I mean, the credit bridge thing was the biggest one recently because we were ready to release without it. And then it basically, it turns into, we have a situation where there's a need and the software isn't able to do it quite the way we want it to. And then my dad will get frustrated and make it. Oh, yeah. Um, that's usually how it goes. Basically, yeah. It's like, what do you mean I won't do that? I'll, we can do that. We'll figure it out. And then give me three or four hours. I'll figure it out and get it programmed. Up. You know, we got to make buttons and what? I make buttons and I make a new tab. And we're, We've been done a couple of times. Yeah. He is working on my, my complete denture module too, right? You've been working on the complete denture module. Well, see, I was. You better be. <laughs> yeah, the Digi Denture, I've got that. It's like half finished. It's, it's part of the download. You can download it. It's still there. It's just hidden. But I stopped working on the Denture module just because Denka. Okay. Yeah, when Brian showed me, like, Brian's my brother. He's a removable tech up at Olson. But he showed me Denka, and that's like that, that's the AI part. I mean, you, you load in your scans, and Oop, here's your dentures. You like them? You know, and I'm like, okay, I can't compete with that. And it's only 20 yeah. bucks. Yeah, and it's per, 20 bucks yeah. to get that. I'm like, they got it priced right. I'm like, you know, I'm good. But I, I mean, you can still do it. I, I can do it, but it's just, I'm not going to advertise that. It's like yeah. the splints. I got a splint module, it does basic splints. It doesn't compete with Patrick Moore's. I mean, his, his is incredible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. I'll let him at. He can own it. That's fine. I'm good with that. You know, I know Crown and Bridge, and I like our Crown and Bridge thing a lot. It's not good for bridges yet. We're still working on it. Mm -hmm. But what we work on currently is more of when CJ runs into things. He's like, "Yeah, my every time I do this, it keeps giving me this result." I'm like, "Oh, I didn't think of that." So I have to go into the code and, and rewrite certain yeah. parts. So it doesn't do whatever it is that it's doing. So it's really troubleshooting right Catching now. Catching bugs, yeah, that kind of thing. That type of thing. But, and then, of course, we'll get an idea. Hey, you think we could? Or we'll see something on like ExoCAD or on a video. Hey, I wonder how they did that. And we just start diving into it and figure it out. So let me ask. If I wanted to open up a lab, only accept intraoral scans, outsource my milling, could I run a single unit crown and bridge lab with this software? Yeah. I would think so. Yeah, you'd want to get a printer, get it like a yeah, yeah, get like a Mars I, Two I, Pro. Yeah, Mars Two Pro. Yeah, we, we use bucks. all of our printers are Elegu printers. I think that's how it's pronounced. Yeah. Um, and they're incredible printers. I love them. I remember when I was there, you guys showed me you had like five or six of them in a row. Yeah, they're two hundred bucks. And yeah, the that's stage, insane. Like, yeah, that's five hundred bucks. We calibrate them every week. Again, as a dental technician, I want control. 
they aren't locked up. I can print any material that 405 nanometer wavelength will affect, right? So all the materials out there that labs are using is 405 nanometer wavelength. And this gives me total control. I can control the how long the light is displayed. I control the lift speed. I can, I can control any part of it. And so when something goes wrong, again, I can diagnose it, calibrate it, and dial it in and get right back into running. Whereas I have nothing against carbon. It's an incredible printer. Something goes wrong, carbon's got to fix it. Yeah. You know, the materials you can print is whatever carbon says you can print. I like, I'm a dental tech. I want to play. So <laughs> yeah, those printers, they're, they're very inexpensive. Get them on Amazon. They're great. They're incredible. And like, any cubic has got good printers. Frozen's mm-hmm. got good printers. You don't have to pay 30 grand for a printer. You can, if you want the support. Again, yeah. you're paying for the support. Yeah. It's like, we um, don't really have support with our printers, but we, we've also taken them apart and they're not that complicated either. You know, they're pretty simple machines. Part of, it's such a low price tag. So And worst case scenario, like we've had to buy new ones and that's still going to cost us less than the investment would be. Our Saturn went down and it's just a Z axis thing. I'm like, we can fix it or 500 bucks. I can get a new one. You know, I'm like, yeah, yeah. that's a no brainer. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, It's like, I'll get a new one and that's spare parts now. You know, so I'm like, okay, but yeah, you could open up a lab with a 3d printer because you'd want to print in house Mm -hmm. Excalibur. And if you're just accepting interroll scans, and you're outsourcing the zirconia, you could. You'd still want a porcelain oven to to stain and glaze, unless you're going to polish. Sure, yeah. No, I was just kind of emphasizing how easy it would be with the software. Yeah. And and if someone wanted to open up a lab, you're not looking to get into the expensive. Right. Well, at least it gives you an option. When I first opened this one, I didn't have... 10, 15 grand to, to get a good software system. So, you know, I was outsourcing my work, which is fine. Yeah, it's a good way to start. Nothing wrong yeah, with it. Yeah, but it was frustrating when I wanted to get something like, you know, some good software. It was very frustrating. This would have been a, an avenue I definitely would have jumped on. And that, then that's basically how I found Patrick Moore mm-hmm. was I was looking for some kind of software I could afford. Yeah. And his is just splints, but I was like, it's something. The scanner too. Started the off with the David. That's yeah, a, that was a nightmare. Yeah. It worked. Very accurate. It takes about an hour and a half to scan in a single case, but it was. Oh, jeez. Yeah. Yeah. But it's not meant for dental. I mean, you can zoom that thing in it. It's super accurate. Insanely accurate, but takes forever. But yeah, again, it was 500 bucks. You know, I'm like, when you're poor, you, you do what you can, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Or when you're starting off, you do yeah. what you can. Right. Yeah, yeah. But if I remember correctly, those printers, you guys were printing with resins that were really exclusive, quote unquote, to other printers. Yeah. So if it goes into mm-hmm. rural, we use anything that's dental because we want it to be FDA cleared if yeah. it's going to go in the mouth. But for models, we just want accuracy. I want accuracy and stability. Things outside of the dental industry offer that. Yeah. It's so. I think it's the same stuff. You know, everything is coming from the same Pretty places. <laughs> just getting rebottled. Uh, sure. So, yeah, we use Soraya Tech because yeah. the bottle that's like 40 bucks yeah. versus, you know, a couple hundred. For sure. Wendy, is the UNC, of course, you guys are printing, but you probably have 17 carbons, right? We only have one carbon. So. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have a, a, some printers. We have a couple Saturns that we use, the Elegoo, that we use just kind of for practicing we call them our play printers where we're kind of learning the CAD workflow so whenever we're learning to play with software and we want to print something low stakes we'll use the inexpensive resin we have a couple of the Strauman printers Mm -hmm. and form labs oh wow that's a quite a a choice people have when they want to play with a printer I know right (laughs) <laughs> are you guys printing your own dentures? I mean, are you printing practice dentures, I should say? Right now we're printing practice dentures. That's like the next phase of my master plan. Ah. <laughs> but I do love, I mean, I love printed dentures. And so I'm working a lot with the carbon resins and the flexeras and even the Denka base too is really nice. So just, you know, trying them all out. Are you finding that that workflow is going well? Oh yeah. Elvis and I talked to a lot of folks and, you know, some are pro and some are in, and some are not ready, but like in your experience, you're super hands-on. So you're happy with that workflow and the way they fit and the whole process. Oh yeah. It's phenomenal. And I mean, it's less expensive. It's more environmentally friendly. They're easy to remake. There's so many benefits to digital dentures. I've been, probably my first digital denture case was 2013. Wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I've, <laughs> I've been doing digital dentures for almost 10 years and it's- I wow. bet you that thing looked great. <laughs> Oh, I worked with Denka. I actually did. And that was what convinced me to to keep going with it was I remember thinking I had just gotten out of my press residency. So I was, you know, really, <laughs> my head was still really big. And I was like, there's no way a computer can make a better denture than I can. And so I made my own. And then I had one made with Denka and the patient preferred Denka. Wow. <laughs> 
and th- from there nice. I was I was hooked and I just kept playing and playing and so I tried all the workflows we we do three different digital denture workflows in the student clinic and it's so predictable we work with Avident following the Wagner yeah. workflow and getting kind of a monolithic milled which is really really great I mean I just don't think anybody can argue with a monolithic milled PMMA yeah There's- agree it's my favorite material <laughs> but if you want something a little bit lower cost um, a little bit faster will work a lot with printed especially for our immediate dentures and our interims are you adding anything analog in that process or is it straight digital i still am a strong believer in border molding and i, I always tell my students i don't care where you border mold you can make a custom tray you can border mold in a try-in you can border mold in your wax room but somewhere you got to pick up that border molding yeah. well that's great do you think scanners are going to get to that point I do. Yeah. I yeah. I mean, to see where they've come from when I started with my trios too. <laughs> I mean, that thing, you could barely scan like one edentulous space, <laughs> but I yeah. mean, it's the way that it's come. So it's getting close. It's just that movable tissue. And I think there's so many people working on different techniques of like creating retractors or something. There's going to be something. And I'll, I'll try it right away. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, you're an early adapter. You're going to be in the front of that line. Yes. Well, you'll want to try it, and then you'll contact Craig, and you'll say, <laughs> Craig. No, Craig, I'm so excited. I just learned about this new thing. <laughs> Make it work. By the way, it's removables, so I mean, it's right up your alley. Yeah. <laughs> so before we started recording, Craig, you're going out there to help with a removable case. Yes. What's up with that? I thought you were a fixed guy. No, <laughs> it's, it's an all on X that we're kind of, Wendy and I are piecing together with the patient we have to do a removable provisional and so that that's the exception he'll make for me (laughs) (laughs) because we just did the upper so i mean then that's that was a fcz you know roundhouse so sure so i was down there what was that three weeks ago two weeks ago i can't remember (laughs) sometime this year whenever she wants me that's when i go yeah i'll help out and like so when it comes to removable stuff that comes into the lab typically I'll send it to my brother. Like I said, he yep. manages the lab up at Olson, manages the removable department, and he's the removable guy. I'm not. And I gave that up back when I was in the Navy, and I mm-hmm. saw a guy playing with monomer and a guy painting with a brush. I was like, I want to do what the guy with the brush is doing. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I just kind of floated over there. It's never appealed to me, which is really weird because Wendy loves removables. And I'm like, you're nuts. And she goes, oh, the monomer smells so good. I'm like, it's horrible. <laughs> yeah, um, you yeah. either like the smell of monomer or you don't. Like, there's just there's yeah, I know. Of people. I know. You are so right there. I've learned that there's an aspect of people that don't even smell it anymore. Those are the people <laughs> that have been stoned. doing it for 40 years. Because yeah. <laughs> they're stoned on it. Yeah, there's something wrong there. <laughs> I have sucked in enough porcelain dust. I'm sure if I get cremated, I'll become a marble, you know, with, <laughs> with some gold specks. Cause I know I've had a couple of miscastings going to my chest too, but there you go. <laughs> I'll take the porcelain dust over that monomer. Whew. But fortunately, Wendy's very patient with me, teaching me even <laughs> still. And, you know, I'm eager to learn. I've always got more to learn and she's an, just an incredible wealth of knowledge. Yeah. Any opportunity I get to learn, I will. And, I, and I'll try, but and I'm sure Wendy will test. I'm not always successful at my tries. <laughs> um, but yeah, removables, I'm like, I'm better off sending it to somebody who knows what they're doing. And I'll watch them do it. I'm like, oh, so that's how you do that. If I can teach 91 dental students to make a denture every year, I can teach Craig. <laughs> like it's taking him a little longer than the second year dental students, but you know. <laughs> you guys have 91 students a year? Uh, we have somewhere between 80 and 90. We um we have some extras jump in the second year class that are international dentists that are earning their license. Yeah, oh, that's, that's great. insanely huge courses. How do you even handle that, many that large of a, yeah, to talk about? How do you show 90 people you're doing it wrong? Yeah. Well, like I said, it's easier to teach 91 than it is to teach Craig. So yeah, I just keep that. that. <laughs> yeah, I'm not even close. Yeah. 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 Well, it's really fortunate now that we have so many different technological aspects to help us. We have like doc cams and Zoom and digital and, you know, it's, it really helps, I think. Yeah, and Merlin, it helps. (laughs) We have Merlin. (laughs) So some of the students are offsite? Not right now. Everybody's back in, but during COVID, the students were offsite for the didactic portions and they were coming to the lab for the hands-on. But I built in a lot of digital exercises into the curriculum to kind of help pace things out a little bit. Yeah, I was going to say, how, how do you manage 91 students in a digital workflow with three printers? 
that's remarkable. I wouldn't even be able to remember their names. I know. <laughs> It was hard with the masks, trying to remember everybody's face because yeah. when we were masking. Now that I'm starting to see people, I learned I recognize people by their teeth. So yes. now that I can see yep. their teeth, it's a lot easier. Uh, we actually also on campus, and a lot of colleges have this, we have something called a makerspace, which I am obsessed with, but I, they have like a wood shop and power tools and laser cutters and all sorts of stuff. But they have a whole wall full of filament printers. So whenever we start doing our CAD CAM exercises in class, the students will actually go over to the makerspace on main campus. Okay. That makes it a little more doable. So that's just like an adult playground? <laughs> yes. It's so cool. It does sound cool. <laughs> so are all the students using the Merlin version? Yes. And basically they get access to it and they can use it at any time and play around with it. Yeah. They download it on their computer, which was actually one of the the biggest benefits of it is that they can, since it's not a heavy software, you can pretty much put it on any computer. And so we had, I think we had one student out of the last three years that had yeah. no more space on his computer <laughs> that couldn't download yeah. it, but all the hundreds of other students all got yeah. it up and ready. Right get rid of all of his 5 million songs he downloaded or <laughs> TikTok videos or something. Yeah. yeah. And the students just love being able to play with it, obviously. I mean, most of them. How, how far are they? Yeah, most of them, I guess. How far are they getting with it? I mean, are they running it like a production? Some of them do and some of them don't. So, I mean, we kind of leave it really open-ended and really all the students are just hungry to learn digital. And I think you'll see that with a lot of the newer dentists is that every time they hear the word digital, they like something turns on, like yeah. whatever piece of them that was, was not listening starts listening. <laughs> Even if it's a software that they can't master very well or that they run into some kinks, they're still being exposed to CAD CAM and they're still learning a little bit. They're picking up something from the digital workflow. So I think even if they don't run it like a production or even if they don't become adept at it, then they understand what Craig is seeing. And I think that's so critical because if you, I mean, all the lab techs that are listening know that if you can't see your margin on the scan, like oh, yeah. you can't, you can't mark the die. And it's, I mean, it's, I think that that's a big misconception that I'm hoping will start to go away as more dentists learn a little more about the digital is that like a bad scan is the same as a bad impression and yeah. hopefully just kind of picking up that CAD workflow and understand why it takes so long to get something back. Cause the design process isn't easy. And, you know, it's like, why can't you get me my crown in two hours, Craig? Like he's like, well, you know, I have to <laughs> scan it and trim the die and build the model. And that's part of the thing that even if they don't grasp the software completely and don't go into the production aspect of it, at least they're being exposed and understanding a little more. That's huge. And I love the connection that you're help making, you know, with these doctors and the lab tech and that mutual respect and saying thank you and how you treat each other. And I, I think that's really important because, you know, as we all know all doctors don't treat us as valuable as we need to be treated. So I love that part of your curriculum. Well, hopefully they're not UNC grads. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> Do you let them know the software was designed and created by a dental technician? Yes, of course. Craig, do you go out there and teach the software? He comes on Zoom. Oh. Yeah, I say Zoom for Zoom. RPD. I said uh, the one custom trade we helped out was Patrick, so. Yeah. Yeah, otherwise it's been Zoom. Yeah, yeah. CJ and I both can hop yeah, on we'll there and hop out. CJ's better at troubleshooting. He's well, he was tech support for eight years. Yeah, so, I mean, he, he knows how to do it. Whereas, sure. They'll, they'll show me the problem. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Hey, CJ. <laughs> that's but pretty much my answer. Since my dad built the software, he's a lot better with the okay. demonstration aspect of it, the usability of it and everything, and just kind of like understanding the workflow. So we, we kind of team up on those sessions. He'll give a demonstration and then I'll go in the background and help anybody that's having technical issues. So it, it works out really well. And how often do you just have to explain to them, just restart the program? I encourage mm -hmm. them to start over. Mm -hmm. uh, that's... <laughs> That's what I always tell people is with digital, you just don't be afraid to play because you can always start over. You can, mm -hmm. you can just close it or you can just start a new page and re-import the scans and start from the beginning. And same with dentures. That's why I don't understand why you don't like dentures. <laughs> well, the only resource we're losing in digital is time. But if you're doing something physical, you're also losing material. So Let's see with the dentures, I think it's, I think it's a monomer. <laughs> it's just the monomer. Yeah. Since that comes out, you start smelling it. It's, it's just like, like nah, a... can't do this. No, no. <laughs> I've got an addictive personality. I don't need to be addicted to monomer. Walk around town with my bottle of monomer. <laughs> I think we all have a little bit of that. 
Just yeah. saying. <laughs> <laughs> I got to control my vices somehow. So yeah. Yep. Stick with that. So is the program going to be in other schools? Are you looking at? Yeah. Anybody who wants to download it, they can. Yeah. I think, uh, I know there's other schools that have been interested. I don't know if they've downloaded it or not. We're not tracking yeah. that. So, I mean, if, if they need help, they'll you know, hopefully send us a message, say, hey, you know, <laughs> uh, we can't get this to work or whatever it is. Usually it's something simple. Yeah. Normally it's user error. Yeah, our co-developer, Dr. Ahmed Maroos, he's from Iowa, and he was using it at his school at University of Iowa. Yeah, he's he's definitely using it with Amira. And as we had a lot of other schools that were interested, they were, originally we were thinking about charging. We were looking at that route, but it just I like the idea we're going open source. Yeah. I prefer to give this to people, as many people as we can. And hopefully, you know, with the spirit of Blender, somebody comes along that will actually improve it yeah, and make so, it even better. Oh, yeah. Sounds I'm like down it. for that. Yeah. yeah. I can think of a half a dozen super digital dental nerds out there mm-hmm. that once they get their hands on it, will dive deep into it. Oh, hell good. yeah. Yeah, yeah good. that's what we want. Well, because yeah. I've got limited time and limited brain cells, to be honest. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, I barely graduated high school, so it's it's one of those scenarios where it's like some, I know they're smarter people, you know, and, and I've seen them, I've met them, you know, I work with them. But like, so that's why I'm glad we're doing it open source. And, oh, and yeah. if somebody else can grab it and run with it, good. I'm not trying to compete with Three Shape or XCAD. Yeah, like no. CJ said, we just got the XCAD license. He's promoted Three Shape for years. Uh, those are great programs. They're awesome. I like ours because I can do anything. I can, yeah. yeah, I can put a monkey on it if I want to. It doesn't matter. Blender doesn't doesn't limit you. Whatever your imagination can think of, and Wendy's is pretty vivid. Uh, <laughs> you can find a way to do it. So, what's the website? Where can people get Excalibur? Okay, so you can download Excalibur at uh, three point X. So number three point in the letter X dot com, and there should be a link right on that home page that takes you to our download page. Yep. So yeah, and Excalibur and Merlin are both available there. There's no nothing locking the educational software as well. So if anybody in the schools are listening and they want to download it, or that could, just anybody's interested in it. Oh, so even if a lab wants to use it to teach, because I want to yeah. start on it. Yeah, yeah, nice. yeah. Start teaching anatomy and RPDs. I just put the link on uh, yesterday on my Instagram bio. So if you go to my click on at Dr. Wendy's world, it'll mm-hmm. pull the link right up. Yeah. Dr. Me. Wendy's world. I love it. Me too. We have to repost that. <laughs> it's on her bio. Um, but yeah, bo- both the softwares are available there. And do you know if three shape or exocads looked at it yet? I don't know. I doubt it. I <laughs> doubt it too. Yeah. Who we, are we? We're, we're, just, we're, we're ants in their giant world. The biggest spike of visitors we had recently to the website was 21 visitors. Squarespace felt the need to notify me. 21 people went to your webpage today. And it was after <laughs> something with uh, some of the students at UNC yeah, had so it's something. Probably related they to Wendy. Yeah, it was probably related to that. So honestly, I, I don't think they've seen it yet. I imagine this might kind of increase some visibility. Yeah, I hope so. so. See what happens. I imagine mean, somebody's <laughs> going to make comment us complaining. Yeah, probably. Whatever. I don't know. It's it, Like I said, it's very important to stress. It's like our support time is limited. <laughs> We'll do what we can when we can. Awesome. I'll make sure I put your personal cell phone number. Yeah. Oh, yeah. thank you so much. Definitely. I'm glad I texted you the other day. <laughs> <laughs> well, awesome, everybody. This is exciting. Yeah. I love the idea of free, open source anything in our industry because so much of it's locked down and the ability just to grow with anything is exciting. Thanks for doing it, Craig, CJ. Thanks for putting the time into it. Wendy, thanks for encouraging them to do it. Yeah. <laughs> exciting stuff. <laughs> and thank you, COVID. Just saying. Yes. <laughs> well. <laughs> well, we appreciate all of you for coming on the podcast to talk about it. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Thanks for having appreciate us. Appreciate you. Thank you for having hey, us. Hey, appreciate it. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Whitmix offers you the ultimate in ease, material flexibility, and unattended production with the Roland DGA. DWX 52 DCI milling machine. The popular mills automatic disc changer expands your lab's production and profit. Using a six slot automatic disc changer, 15 station automatic tool changer, and several other automated features. The DWX 52 DCI dental milling machine now comes with performance software and other intelligent updates. The five-axis mill even knows which tool to automatically swap out when tools have reached their designated lifespan. Just power it on, let it go, and automatically and accurately mill numerous dental restoration jobs with complete unattended confidence. 
If you're interested in learning more about the Roland DGA DWX 52 DCI, visit Whitmix.com or call 1-800-626-5651. And as always, we appreciate your support of the podcast, Whitmix. A super thanks, a super big thanks to Craig, CJ, and Dr. Clark for joining us on the podcast. That was a great, great interview. And here, we thought every dental school has given up on teaching removables. I hope all of the other schools will get a Dr. Clark to teach them too, so that we can start having more dentists enter the field knowing what the hell they are doing with removables. And if you are looking to check out the software, head over to this episode's show notes to a link and then download it for free. It might be a nice backup to have for all the times the other softwares freeze up, just saying. Thanks again for coming on our podcast. If you know of another good technician and doctor team that you know of, we would love to talk to more amazing teams doing amazing things. And now, to help us celebrate CDT and Dental Laboratory Appreciation Month, here are the audio thanks that we got this week. The first one is from Dr. Brian Harris. So oftentimes I think about how lucky I am to show up every day and get to transform people's lives and change their smiles. You know, as a cosmetic dentist, it it really is such a blessing to be a part of this profession. One of the things that I've been thinking about recently, you know, with this being Dental Lab Technician Appreciation Month is, is how little recognition the lab technician gets for a, a massive role that they play in the process. And so I wanted to just take a minute and thank Bob, Bob Clark, Williams Dental Lab, who has been my ceramist for a number of years now and is just truly, truly an artist. You know, I never thought that I'd find somebody as passionate about dentistry as I was, you know, and and who worked as hard as I do every single day. So I did though, you know, I I see Bob showing up day after day and just really focused on providing amazing results for his doctors, you know, and and when it's weekend and he's messaging me at 10 p.m. on a Sunday night, you know, I know that he is truly loving what he does and he's there at the lab you know creating smiles because he loves it you know not because he has to but because he truly loves it so bob you know i want to thank you for being such a huge part of my success in my practice and uh, without you i could not deliver the smiles that i do on a daily basis so thank you i hope this month is filled with many other thank yous from from doctors that you work with and uh, i truly do appreciate you thanks bud Hey guys, this is Blake Barksdale, General Manager of Barksdale Dental Laboratory in Huntsville, Alabama. I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank all of my best friends and mentors in this industry. Number one, my father, Steve Barksdale, CDT and Ceramics in Crown and Bridge. Jesse McDonald, one of my mentors for many years, CDT and Ceramics. Kayla Nakanishi, Trey Ford, Thomas Blanchett, Barbara Blanchett, Larry Weiss, David Avery, Jamie Stover. All these guys have helped me, and I can't be thankful enough for what this industry has brought me in my life and helped me change my life. God bless and thank you very much. And this thanks is for Monica Buchanan. She would like to thank Jill Dexter, a distant relative, of course, who passed in 2020 for getting her into this mess. She got her, Monica, her first lab job, encouraged her to learn all she can and encourage her to start getting her CDT, probably so Jill could retire. She would also like to thank Sue Herman for being her rock through learning on the go and giving her direction. And Dave, not a CDT, but knows just as much, for opening and staying in the lab with her and helping her get the computer fixed before the practical exam, even after she started crying for no reason and made him feel bad. Aww. Her exam results are on the way. Good luck. Hello, hello to my favorite podcast duo, Nina speaking. Just wanted to send some appreciation to some of my my technician friends. So in not particular order, to Deepa, Janelle, Eric, Mackenzie, Katie, Dani, Rob, Jens, Jean, Justin, Gita, Beth, Kelly, Ricardo, James, Marite, and many more that I cannot name because we will be here till tomorrow. 
thank you for being such badass technicians and for inspiring me on a daily basis to be the best that I can. Oh, and let's not forget my, to my manager, Phil, and the team from Mango Dental, who made me feel so welcome in the new lab. Thank you so much. Well, thanks for the thanks, everyone. There is only one more episode left for you to send in your audio appreciation. Don't go into July wishing that you did. I don't care if we have a six-hour episode if we get enough people to record themselves on their phones or computers and send them in. Well, maybe a six-hour episode might be a little long, but we still want you to send them in. So email them to info at voicesfromthebench.com. All right, everybody, that's all we got for you. We will talk to you next week. Bye. Bye. Her ed- oh god, you gotta do this.